Yep, the reading is John chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame and paralysed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him, that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. The father judges no one but has given all judgments to the Son, that all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. Whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment." Well, if you were here last Sunday, you'll know that we were looking at the man, or the story of the man who had been lame for 38 years. And uh, Jesus came to him and spoke a word to him, and at the word of Jesus, uh, wasted ligaments and muscles sprang to life, blood flows to withered limbs, and the man walks again. He walks for the first time in maybe 13,000 days and nights. Now, the miracle was indisputable. There was no doubt that it happened. And had Jesus stopped at that point, probably there would not have been any trouble. But Jesus pokes the bear, as it were, by telling the man to pick up the mat on which he was lying, put it on his shoulder and walk. And the rules of the establishment of the day said you can't carry a mat on the Sabbath day, which is what the the day was. And uh, the question, I suppose, is who does Jesus think he is to tell a man to break 
the laws of the establishment. Well, frankly, he thinks he's God. (laughs) He knows he's God. And he says, God the Father doesn't stop working just because of the Sabbath day. And so I don't stop working just because of the Sabbath day. My father brings up the sun each morning, Sabbath day is included. He holds the laws of gravity in place, Sabbath day is included. He makes the food keep growing to feed people, Sabbath day is included. So if he's doing that on the Sabbath day, why shouldn't Jesus walk, work on the Sabbath day? And why shouldn't he make the rules about what you can do on the Sabbath day and not do on the Sabbath day if he's God? Which, as I say, is exactly what Jesus believes he is. And so he says in the verse, which was at the end of the passage we had last Sunday, in verse 17, my father is working until now and I am working. Now, if if telling the man to carry his mat on the Sabbath day was a poke in the eye for these men... Saying that was doubly provocative. You can almost hear the gasps in the crowd and look, see the looks of horror on people's faces as they put their hands over their ears so they won't hear such blasphemous things. Because they know that when Jesus says that, he's making himself equal with God. Um, there'll be people today who say, well, Jesus never claimed to be equal with God. Well, the people who were there who knew the language he used and who knew the terms that uh, were important to him, they knew exactly what he was saying. Of course he claimed he was God. Unlike the claims of the Jehovah's Witnesses and others who say, no, he's not. Well, you've got a choice here. Either Jesus is right and the people who heard him and knew the language, they got it right, or other groups have got it right, but it can't be both. And uh, they knew these, these heavy, these people in the establishment, the heavies in the establishment, they knew that this was a big deal that Jesus was claiming to make himself equal with God. And I hope you also think it's a big deal. I think there's a danger in this passage this morning and in the passages that follow in John's Gospel for us to think, well, this is all a bit sort of heady stuff. It's really more for a a doctrine lecture, surely. Can't we just have some more stories about what Jesus does? Or can't we, if if he has to preach... How about he preached some stories, like parables or something? But no, we're coming to a section which is pretty pretty weighty when it comes to uh, things that are true about the living God. And I hope that um, this morning, as we look at these these verses, as we hear uh, the Lord Jesus preaching, which is what he's doing, that we see the themes and we see the importance of them. And I want to draw out two themes this morning, if if I may. And they both start with the letter C. And then there's an implication or an application for each of them, also starting with the letter C. But the two, the two points, the two main themes, I think, in this passage are clarity and centeredness. Clarity. Well, John's written this so that we are clear, so that we have clarity about the person of the Lord Jesus. That's the first thing, clarity about the person of Jesus. There's a lot of talk in the Bible about Jesus being the Son and then there being God the Father. And uh, our danger as we hear those sorts of terms, we think, well, Father, Son, Uh, higher, lower, Uh, more important, less important, Um, older, younger. Father, Son for us means something different. But yet when Jesus says, my father is working, they say, no, he's making him equal with God, not less than, not lower than. He's making himself the same as God. The reason they can say that is because if you're a Jew, then you use the phrase son of a lot. Um, It's a way of talking about someone who has the same characteristics as the father. So when we get to chapter 8 of John's Gospel, we'll find that Jesus refers to these same people and he calls them, you are sons of Satan. What do you mean, sons of Satan? 
Well, he says, because Satan wants to kill me, and that's what you want to do. You have the same characteristics as Satan. So son of does not mean less than. It means having the same characteristics as. That's why here in this chapter, they say he's making himself equal with God. It's sameness, not higher and lower, even though that's what the terms father and son might indicate to us. Now, when you think about it, we speak like that. Um, the other day I was looking at Josh Davis and I thought, the way he turns his head and the way he walks, it's just like his dad. He's a chip off the old... I'd say, we might say he's a real son of his father. And when we say that, we're not, saying there's, we're not talking about the difference between them, we're talking about the sameness. They have the same qualities or characteristics. When Jesus says, my father, he's not saying he's up there and I'm down here in terms of difference of character. He's saying, no, father, son, same characteristics. We actually have the same nature, the same qualities. What makes my father God is what makes me God. So we need to just uh, beware of that father-son language, I think. The son is not the father. The father is not the son. But there's a sameness between them. There's an equality of nature between them. Uh, they're distinct from one another. So Jesus doesn't, never says, I'm the father. No, the father. There's the father and there's the son. There's a distinct, there are two persons. And of course, there's a third person in the Godhead. And we'll come to the Holy Spirit when we get later on in John's Gospel. So there is a difference between them. And there's a difference in what they do. And that comes out in this, this passage this morning. See, what Jesus does doesn't originate with him. He doesn't do what he does because he thought thinks it's a good idea or say what he says because he likes what, what, what he thinks. No, he takes his lead from his father. So we read in verse 19, uh, the second part of verse 19, whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. There's a sameness there between them. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and then the son acts. The father shows the son, and later in the, in the passage that Jesus speaks about always seeing the father, he looks to his father and he takes his lead from his father. So sameness of nature, difference of person, two persons, and sometimes difference of work. The father has the plan and the son executes the plan. The father doesn't judge Jesus can say in verse 22, the father judges no one but has given all judgment to the son. The father doesn't receive honour directly. He receives it only through the son. There's a difference. So in verse 23, whoever does not honour the son does not honour the father who sent him. Sameness of nature but difference of role and work. Difference of work and activity. The father makes the plans, the son executes the plans. The father will receive honour only if it is firstly given to the son. Now, in saying all that, that's the end of the first point. And you might say, well, hang on, I'm not sure that clears up all the questions I've got about how, <laughs> how, how the Godhead works. And I'm sure I haven't cleared them all up. But that much is at least clear. Same nature, two persons, but there's a, there's a difference of action and activity. Well, what flows from that? Being clear, having clarity about the person of Jesus. Well, I think what flows from that is contentment, folks. See, do I need, do I, can I, do I need to say, well, if, if God came down and stood here, then I'd believe that there's a God. But until I see him, uh, well, I'm not really sure I'm, going, I'm content that there is a God. Well, God did come and stand here. Just that I wasn't there when he stood here. But it did happen. And he's already done it, and no more proof is needed. We're content with the revelation of God the Son, showing us who God is. It would be pretty arrogant to say, well, he's got to do it in every, in every age, in every year, to every person, in every place, before we believe. No, he came. He said, look at me, it's God. 
Does God need to answer any more questions which Jesus has not already answered? No, the wise and merciful God was here and he said, I've told you all you need to know. You don't need to know anything more than what I've told you. But we missed out because we don't have any of the add-on stuff that the Mormons have or the JWs or the bells and whistles of Roman Catholicism. No, the true and living God was here. What could we have missed out on if we know him? If Jesus had given himself to us and for us as the living God, what could it, whatever could we say we've missed out on? See, our demandingness for more proof or more answers or more religion or more treasures arise from the fact we forget that the true and living God was here. And he said it all, and he did it all. And friend, that's the secret to deep contentment. If you've got Jesus, you've got it all. And there's nothing else you really need. Nothing. And I suppose if you get that right, then that also, also tells us that we, can, that we should be discontent. Um, so I, I don't know about you, but I always find it a bit discontenting. If that's a word. I'm not content when people want to talk about God, as it were, anonymously. God in inverted commas. I mean, we all believe in God, don't we? I mean, what's the difference between us and this group and this group and this group and that group? We all believe in God. Well, one of the complaints I used to receive fairly regularly in another church where I pastored more than 40 years ago here in Tamworth was that I should talk less about Jesus and more about God. And the elders came to elders meetings and said, we're tired of hearing about Jesus. Tell us about God. And of course that would have made people much more comfortable because you can still be a member of the Masonic Lodge and talk about God, but not Jesus. That's a challenge if that's the case, if we have to talk about Jesus as well. It makes you perhaps a bit uncomfortable because other churches in town just talk about God and all the time here we're on about Jesus. Does that mean that we're different? We're not like the others. But you see, if you talk about God in that anonymous kind of way and we don't talk about the Lord Jesus, what we end up with is not biblical Christianity. Because biblical Christianity is Christ-centred, Jesus-centred. Everything hangs on Jesus. What God the Father does, he does in Jesus. And God the Father, indeed, Jesus says, he will not receive any honour unless it's firstly shown to the Son. So if you want to leave Jesus out and say, well, we'll just have God, like the Jews have God, uh, and that's enough, no, that's not biblical Christianity. And we can never be content with that. You can talk about God all you like, but if Jesus is not front and centre, then whatever else you've got is not, as I say, biblical Christianity. And uh, once you've seen who Jesus really is, God himself made flesh, you'll never be content about the half with the half-baked versions of Christianity which aren't Christianity at all. But you can be wonderfully content that in the person of Jesus you've got all you need. You need nothing else. Nothing else. Well, clarity about the person of Jesus leads to contentment, I think. And the other main theme in the passage this morning, I think, is centrality. The centrality of the words of Jesus. I don't know whether you, if you've been following the last few weeks I think there's a theme that should have really hit you fair and square uh, between the eyes. When we were back in chapter 4 and Jesus is with the woman of Samaria at the well, 
No lightning, no thunder, no fancy tricks. Jesus speaks to her. And then she goes off to the other people in the town and says, I'll tell you what he said to me. And they listen. And then they come and they listen to Jesus. And they say, oh, we believe now, not because of what she said, but because of what he said. And that's followed very quickly at the end of chapter 4 of the, with, the, with the man, the official, who has a, a, young, a young son who's dying. And he's, he's over there somewhere. The man comes to Jesus, but his son is over there. And, and Jesus just says, go, he's healed. He speaks the word. No fancy tricks. Jesus doesn't carry a bag of tricks with him. He carries a mouthful of words. He speaks the word. He came to the man, the man who'd been lame for 38 years. Again, nothing dramatic. He speaks words to him. Get up, take up your bed, go home. And immediately, says John, the man's healed and he walks again. Jesus' words brings life. Jesus' words make life. Jesus' words are front and centre in all that he's done. And so that's what we find here in this passage. And so he says in verse 24, if you look at the word there, he's, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life, here and now. But Michael was praying in our prayer this morning. You have eternal life right now in this world. You do, not, you do not come into judgment at the end. You've already passed from death to life. He who hears my words. What determines your future is what you do with my words. That's pretty arrogant. Unless you're God. <laughs> then it's not arrogant. And I tell you, friends, if you don't hear Jesus' words in this life, here and now, you'll hear them at the end. So verse 28, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs, every graveyard anywhere in the world, will come, sorry, will hear his voice and come out. <laughs> you, you imagine a hundred, if you were to die next week and we bury your body, where, where's your body a hundred years from now? Well, it's dust in all sorts of places and it's become part of vegetation become part of what other animals become. and I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a mess and a half. But Jesus says, no, at the end, you will hear my voice and you'll get up out of your grave. That's the power of the word of Jesus. It can bring back together what had been thoroughly disintegrated. And not you alone, but everyone. All who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So if you don't hear Jesus' voice in this world and obey it, and take it to heart, you'll certainly hear it at the end and it will be irresistible. It'll get you out of your grave. Now, if I said that uh, your future, your heaven and hell future, depends on what you do with what I'm saying, that would be the height of arrogance. But if I were God... And that's what I would say. Then that makes it different, doesn't it? There is such power in the words of Jesus that no matter how you died or where you died or how long you've been dead, his word will raise you. Just like, just like Lazarus, you remember? Lazarus had been dead only four days, but in that climate, four days is enough to, for your body to start decomposing and stinking. And Jesus just says two words, Lazarus, Out. He walks out. At the word of Jesus, that's what the word of Jesus does. That's the power in the word of Jesus. And then uh, once he, once he, uh, there are more words to come at the end, aren't there? Uh, when he gets, when he says to you, you and you and to me, out, up, out of your grave. Then he says, come, all you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the beginning of the world. And to the rest, he'll say, depart from me. And nobody will protest. Nobody will be able to protest. His word will do what it says. Come, and he'll bring you. Go, depart, and you'll go. At the word of Jesus. Friends, words, words are important anyway in life. But with the person of the Lord Jesus, they're vital. 
Jesus has his words always front and centre. Not his fancy, not any fancy tricks. Uh, it's not in the end about miracles. And indeed, you remember the, the story of the, the rich man who died and who said to Jesus, uh, said, to, said, to, said to God the Father, look, why don't you send the prophet back to my brothers? I don't, I don't want them to come to this place of torment like I have. Send them someone back from the dead. Show them a miracle. Then they'll believe. He said, no, no. They've got the words of God. They've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Words are always front and centre. Now, how can Jesus' words do things like that? Well, I think John tells us in verse 26. He says, As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So you and I depend on lots of things to breathe and to live. We depend on oxygen and we depend upon food and we depend upon the sustaining hand of God because we don't have life in ourselves. Our life is always hanging on something else. It's dependent, not independent. But Jesus says, no, the Son has life in himself. There's, a, there's life in, in the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, that means when he speaks, things happen. When he doesn't speak, they don't happen. For real Christians, the words of Jesus, like the person of Jesus, is front and centre, are front and centre. He is front and centre, his words are front and centre. And friends, if you had to boil down what Christianity is all about, that's it. Jesus is God, and his words are his powerful means of doing great things. End of story. Now, there's more, of course, but that's the essence of it. And what flows from that? What flows from seeing the centrality of the words of Jesus? Well, I think confidence. Confidence. See, if Jesus' words can give life here and now, then who is there that's beyond the ability to live? Is there anyone you know in your family or where you work or here in this church who is beyond the power of the life-giving words of Jesus? No, his words can break through the hardest heart and the most closed mind. He can make people live. So the fact of the power of his words gives us great confidence. What about what will grow our church? There are lots of things that make up a church, church life. Of course there are. But will we swap his life-giving words for tricks or feel-good experiences or a few miracles, maybe? Well, we'd only do that if we'd lost confidence in the power of the words of Jesus. But if we've got, if we've got that confidence because his words are true and Jesus has life in himself when he speaks his word, then we'll hang on to those words no matter what. Will we be intimidated by people who say, you know, you, you people, you make too much of the words of Jesus. Uh, do you worship the Bible? No, we're not intimidated by that. Not when we're confident that words, the words Jesus speaks are words of life. Of course we love our Bible. And of course we love his words. And if the next thing you're going to hear after you die is the voice of Jesus, if the next thing you're going to hear in your body after you die is the, is the words of Jesus, and if you know that it's to Jesus whom you belonged in this world, the same Jesus, then there's nothing to fear for the last day. Nothing to fear in judgment. Jesus said, no, here and now you've passed already from death to life. There's nothing to hold against you. There's no chance, there's not a chance in anywhere that you'll suffer any kind of judgment because it all hangs on what you've done with me and my words. 
So that's a bit of a wake-up call, isn't it? Because we won't hear his words now. You sure will hear them at the end. But then, of course, it'll be too late. So he says, hear my words now, because I who speak to you from the words of Scripture is the same person who will raise you at the end by my powerful word. So I ask you, friends, uh, that, that's perhaps all a bit heavy going in some respects, but these are the words that Jesus has spoken, and what good words they are. Words that make it so clear that who, of who he is, so that we'll be content with the fact that Jesus is God. We'll be clear about that. Not half, not half hearted. And I'll tell you, friends, if you're confident Jesus really is God, then about a million other things, a million other issues and problems just dissolve. If he's God. Now, there's a contentment when it's like that. And so, will we resolve with all our heart and strength to be as clear as we can possibly be about the person of Jesus? And will we resolve as much as we can possibly be to be clear about the words of Jesus? and their centrality in the ministry of Jesus so that we're fully confident today, tomorrow, and on the day that he returns. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these words are written for our instruction and we confess that we don't find them easy to understand in some respects. And they sound remote from the sort of lives that we live day in, day out. Yet, Heavenly Father, they are anything but. And so we pray that as a, they have been written for us. Give us grace, we pray, uh, to be focused on the Lord Jesus, not to be content with religion, not to be content with an anonymous kind of God, but to be, have a passion for Jesus, who is God himself. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that having a passion for him, we'll have a confidence in his word, knowing that his words do great and wonderful things. Lord, these are, these are to be marked of us. And if they haven't been marked of us in the past, we pray that you'll turn our hearts around and our minds around so that what should have been true becomes true and that you'll save us from walking away from things that are of fundamental and great importance so that it might be to Jesus that we give the honour and the praise. And we ask in his name. Amen.